Welcome back everyone to Finding the Middle Path, Be Drama Free Through DBT. In this episode, we're going to talk about two skills, improve and self-soothe. Let's get going. Our first skill is called improve. And I know you're probably getting tired of acronyms at this point. I promise this will be the last one for a little bit before we have to come back to more acronyms. So the skill improve is for improving the moment. The I is imagery, the M is meaning, the P is prayer, the R is for relaxation, the O is for one thing in the moment, the V is for vacation, and the E is for encouragement. The I, imagery, tells us to imagine something pleasant. So you can imagine relaxing scenes of a calming, safe place. You can imagine things going well, or you can imagine painful emotions draining out of you from one way or another. One of the tricks with imagery is that you have to practice it a lot when you're not in distress in order to be able to effectively use it when you are in distress. I mean, let's face it, when you get upset about something, if you're angry or sad, your first inclination isn't going to be pause. Let me imagine soothing scenes in Hawaii. It's just not going to happen. So imagery requires finding time to imagine those safe places that you know and enjoy or imagining and thinking about how things actually are going to go or how you actually want them to go. The last one, imagining painful emotions draining out of you somehow, is one of my favorites. From time to time, I will get a little bit angry. I mean, I'm human, just like everybody else. One of the things I like to do when I have those angry feelings is go back to the good old days of cartoons, and I imagine myself turning red and then steam coming out of my ears, just like an old-fashioned cartoon. And it works a couple different ways. Number one, it actually feels like my anger is coming out of me. And number two, it makes me giggle. Just thinking of myself in that ridiculous position, it always gets a giggle for me. So that might be something that you could practice in the future. The M meaning is to find some purpose or meaning or value in the pain of whatever is going on. This one is really difficult for teenagers, which I'll touch on a little bit later. But if you can help them to find something that they're getting out of whatever it is that they're going through, it can be very helpful to improve that moment that they're in. The P is for prayer, or what I also like to add in there could be practice meditation. So praying, of course, is just sort of opening yourself up to a supreme being or a greater wisdom, whatever it is that you that you believe in. You could also use meditation to access your own wise mind. So there are a lot of teenagers that I've met in my time that they don't believe in a higher power. They're not really sure what's up there. They're pretty sure there's not anything up there. And I still want them to be able to practice this particular skill. So by practicing meditation, it allows them to access their own wise mind, which I've yet to have one argue that they don't have one. Everyone has a wise mind. And even if you don't know how to access it, it's in there. So that is often something that they can use when they don't believe in any sort of a higher power or higher being. The R is for relaxation. So you can do a couple different things with that. You could do technical relaxation exercises, so like progressive muscle relaxation, which we've talked about before, or you can just engage yourself in a relaxation activity, whatever it is that works for you. Some of the examples that they give in the DBT Skills Adolescent Manual is stretching or practicing yoga. I don't know about you, but none of those things relax me. I am not flexible in any way, shape or form. So stretching is kind of stressful to me. I only do it because I really, really have to. But if that's something that's relaxing to you, you can do that. Other examples of things that are relaxing to other people, but maybe not me, bubble baths. I just don't get it. You're just soaking in a tub of water with, you know, yourself. That's never really been something that I like to do, but a lot of people find it to be really relaxing. So the key with this is to figure out what's relaxing to you and how you can engage in that particular activity.
Continuing on, we've got one thing in the moment. So this is focusing your attention on what you're doing right now and keeping your mind in the moment so it doesn't dwell upon things in the future or even things in the past. This is another one that's really difficult for teenagers because I've yet to meet a teenager that doesn't want to just be a grown up right now. I mean, even myself, when I was a teenager, I just wanted to be a grown up where nobody could tell me what to do. Nobody was the boss of me. I was the boss of myself. I learned later that that's never going to be the case. <laughs> but in any case, one thing in the moment is something that is very difficult for a teenager to do. So it requires a lot of thought and effort in how to help them just be in the moment and do whatever it is that they're doing right then and focus all their attention on it. We'll talk about that a little bit later on some of the things that could be helpful. The V vacation is give yourself a brief vacation. That could mean spending some time outside, taking a break from hard work that has to be done, or unplugging from all electronic devices. Now, the idea behind vacation is that you're taking a break from reality. So the difference between imagery and vacation would be imagery is you're probably still in the situation, but you're using your mind to kind of escape a little and do some imagination exercises. Vacation is when you actually take a step back from whatever it is that you're doing and take a vacation that way. So that's the main thing to remember between imagery and vacation is that they're very similar, but one is using your imagination and the other is actually taking a step back from reality and doing something that's different than what it is that you're doing at the current moment that might be distressing. The E of improve is encouragement. So this is cheerleading yourself and using affirmations, pretty much anything like that. All right, and that is the skill of improve. Our next skill that we're gonna talk about is called self-soothe. And this skill is when you soothe yourself by using your six senses. Now there's a couple different things that are cool about this skill. The first is that, one, you can use it to tolerate distress, but you can also use it as preventative self-care. A lot of times in today's society, we get really caught up, we're really busy, we're, we're on the go, 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 and we kind of forget to take that time to stop and just take care of ourselves for a few minutes. And it doesn't have to be anything big, it could be small things, but it's anything that you do with your senses. And in DBT, we have six senses, so you have your normal vision, taste, hearing, touch and smell, but they add in there the sense of movement. So any sort of a movement that is soothing to you, you can add in there as part of self-soothing with your six senses. Now, again, as I, I told you a couple weeks ago, there are some warnings with some of the skills, and this is one of them. Some self-soothe activities that you engage in can lead to unhealthy behaviors, and this is mostly around the area of um, taste. So if you always use self-soothe taste to deal with everything that's stressful, it can lead to overeating or stress eating, which are both unhealthy behaviors. So of course, mindfulness is really important to practice while you're using self-soothe and make sure that you're not developing an unhealthy coping mechanism. The other thing to remember with self-soothe is that sometimes the point of the skill isn't necessarily to make you feel better immediately, but rather to prevent you from feeling worse. So if you're at a really low point in life and you go on a walk outside, right, to use your senses of sight, seeing the things around you, and maybe touch, feeling the wind on your face, it's not necessarily going to make you feel like a hundred times better. You could think of it sort of as more like a, an emotional tourniquet. So you're do, using the skill in order to stop the emotions from getting worse so that you don't continue to spiral downward. And over time, if you continue to practice those skills, eventually they might help you start feeling better. But if you're using the skills and they aren't, they aren't immediately having the effect that you want, don't quit. Just keep using them because it may just be that right now they're just preventing it from getting worse and they aren't yet to the point where things are going to be able to get better for you emotionally and that's okay. Emotions come and go as we've talked about and if you're at the point where the skill is just making it so it's not worse that's totally acceptable. That's one of the ways that we're supposed to use skills. 
Okay, using Improve and Self-Soothe at work. So with Improve, there's a lot you can do with each of the letters. One of the things that's really cool about this skill is that you don't have to be in distress to use it. You can use it as a preventative measure in order to help yourself just be in a better place when distressing things do happen. So for I, imagery, you can imagine your responses to things that you've struggled with in the past, and that helps to get you better prepared for future situations that may mimic those things. You can also just use it as imagining the times that you've had that you enjoy. So imagine that last vacation that you took with your family, or imagine that last walk that you took outside when you saw a really cool bird flying that you'd never seen before. <laughs> you can use imagery for those types of things, and it doesn't take very long. It's just, you know, 30 seconds of taking some time to yourself to use your imagination and think about things that bring happiness to you. The M for the meaning. I like to try and take meaning from difficult situations that I've faced and then turn them into learning experiences. So at my place of employment, one of the things we do is we try and have, um, we call them coping sessions. So whenever anything big happens at work, we have a meeting with myself and my supervisor and whoever it is that was involved in the situation. And we talk about what happened and what things went well for them, what things could be done a little bit better, or what things need to be different so that things like that don't happen in the future. That's one way to take meaning from a difficult situation is because you learn how to deal with it differently. For the P, prayer or practice meditation, again, simple things. You can take a few minutes if you're someone that enjoys praying or that feel takes comfort from that. You can take a few minutes in the middle of your day, at the end of your day, at the beginning of your day to try and connect with that higher power to give you some strength to get through the day, get through the moment. If you aren't one a person that really likes to pray, you can practice meditation. And that's as easy as taking time to take three deep breaths and really just focus on your breathing and connect with yourself. So either one of those will work. One thing in the moment is, is this is kind of tricky sometimes, especially when you have a lot going on at home. But one thing I like to think about is finding ways to make what you're doing into something that will bring all of your attention to it. So as an example, when I worked at Taco Bell, we had to do a lot of uh, tasks that were not always enjoyable, but one of the ways I found to make them enjoyable was to put it, myself into competition with myself. So I called it in my head the Golden Bell Olympics, and it was specifically I would see how fast I could make bags of nachos into trays, and I would imagine that I was like a gold medal winner of bagging nachos. <laughs> And it's just a little game that I made up in my head so that I could be in the moment and actually do the best job that I could with something that wasn't really that enjoyable. So if you can find things like that, you know, how fast can I do this or how well can I do this other thing that I've never done before, that can really help you to stay in that moment and not focus on, you know, the things that are bothering you outside of work or things that are going on outside of um, in the world is, you know, there are a lot of things going on in the world right now. And when you're at your job, you have to find a way to be able to be completely present at your job, both for yourself and for the people that you work with. The V is one that is very important because I, well, I picked it because I have a hard time with it. So vacation, take a break from your actual job. I have a, I have difficulties with this one because I want to do my job the most efficiently that I can. So for me, that sometimes means that I want to work through my breaks. I had some very smart people tell me, you need to stop. You need to take a break and do something that's not work or you're going to burn out. If you work in social services or you work with teenagers or you work in education, those are fields that have pretty high rates of burnout. We need those breaks. So even if it's just for half an hour, 10 minutes, whatever it is, take your break. It's really important to make sure that you're able to rejuvenate yourself. Personally, I start to take walks. I especially do that with if I'm overwhelmed with something at work or it's been a very high anxiety type of day. 
I take a walk and get out of the building completely and just allow myself time to be away from work. You can also just, if you don't have a lot of time to take a walk, you just spend time outside. Really being outside is one thing that is pretty beneficial for everyone. So vacation, take a work, take a break. And then the last one, of course, is oh, I skipped re relaxation. But again, you could find something short and that's relaxing to you. If you like guided meditations, there's a lot of guided meditation videos out there on YouTube or podcasts, um, podcasts that you can look into that have short guided meditations that you can do in like five or six minutes. So those could be things or just taking a few minutes to yourself. You know, that can also be relaxation. Encouragement is affirmations. So just, man, I can I can make it through this day. I got this. Just saying that over and over to yourself in your head. Whatever works for you. Those are the ones that work for me is that I, I can get through this. I got this. I have to say that to myself a lot. For self-soothe, one, you can bring things that are soothing to you. And then I like to call it um, a survival kit. So for me, my survival kit, and I don't necessarily have it all together, but they're things that I have with me pretty much all the time. And I have my headset, I have podcasts that make me laugh, and I have like a list of songs that make me happy. One of which, if you've never listened to Shake It Off by Taylor Swift, definitely a happy song. I also bring a book usually to work that I'm, I can read, even if I'm just reading it off and on and my D and D stuff so that if I need to take a break from work and just totally throw myself into making up my D and D world, I've got it there. The last thing I like to have is a snack of some sort and I've got a bit of a sweet tooth. So usually it's something that kind of goes on the sweet side so you can use the self soothe taste, but those are all the things that I pretty much always have with me whenever I go to work because I don't want to be caught in a moment when I'm really struggling and I don't have something to help me. So take some time to think about things that help you and what are some small things that you can bring with you. So if you're struggling in the moment, you know exactly what to do. All right, so how teenagers relate to improve and self-soothe. With improve, this is probably the most popular skill or the most favorite skill of all the skills that we teach. And that's because a lot of the letters are really easy and they're pretty fun to use. One of them, one of the letters that really trips them up though is meaning. So if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that at one point we talk about brain development and that the part of the brain that is involved in consequences and being able to see long term is hasn't been formed yet in the teenagers or it's still in the process of being forming. So because of that, they may need a little bit of guidance in seeing how something is going to be beneficial for them, especially if it's something that they're not enjoying at the moment. The other part is if you're working with a group of teenagers or with teenagers that have some sort of trauma in their life, this is a very tricky letter to use because let's face it, there are some things that teenagers go through that there is absolutely no reason why they should have had to go through that and be prepared for that answer is if they say, what can you get from this? I'm like, well, this never should have happened to me. I find that the easiest way to head that off is say, you're absolutely right. There never, this never should have happened to you. And there's not a reason why you should have to go through it. Let's find something that you can do for yourself so that you can get to a better future. And we won't have to talk about that thing that happened in the past. I mean, if that's where you have to go for the meaning, then that's where you have to go. But you have to be very careful with that particular letter and that particular experience for the teenagers. So it takes a lot of thought and a lot of finesse in the moment. So that's one thing that you could definitely practice is figuring out what you're going to say in those situations if you're trying to, to teach these particular skills. The other part that's a little bit difficult is one thing in the moment. So as, as you know, and maybe you don't know, but it's really difficult when you're a teenager because you just want your life to start. You just want to be a grown up. You just want to be able to be in charge of yourself. So staying in the moment is really difficult. So you just have to kind of figure out ways to get them to just be in the moment, or at least if you can't get them to be in the moment, be in the now. So 
um, a tip from one of the teenagers that I worked with before was, you know, at our treatment center, they have to stay there for a pretty long time. And this girl did not want to stay for a long time. So she said what finally helped her was looking forward to each meal. So when she woke up in the morning, she said, okay, I will make it until breakfast and then we'll see where to go from there. She'd get to breakfast and then she'd say, okay, I'm going to make it until lunch and then we'll see what, where I go from there. And she did that every single day for the entire time that she was there. And though it's not necessarily staying in the exact moment, it kept her in the moment in the sense that every day she was able to get through. Um, one thing in the moment also can kind of be related to a, the AA saying, one day at a time. So being able to live that way, it gets you through a long period of time by just focusing on what's happening for this day. So that's one thing that you can look at too, is how can you just be in this day and not worried about things that are happening in the future? For self-soothe, this one is also really popular, but again, you need to be really careful with taste, especially with teenagers. So teenagers form their habits that they keep as their adults. So if they form an unhealthy relationship with food because they've used that as their main coping skill, that's something that's really tough to shake when you grow up and become an adult and you still have that as your main coping skill. So whenever you talk about self-soothe, you can talk about nutrition as well so that when they're using self-soothe taste specifically, they know that they should also be thinking about a little bit about nutrition, you know, and not overusing that particular skill. One other thing you can do is practice with them mindfulness exercises when they're using taste so that they don't need the quantity and are focused more on the quality of what they're eating and the quality of the experience of eating. So I think I've mentioned before that I do a mindfulness exercise with a Snickers bar and it's a little tiny mini Snickers bar. And most of the time, the teenagers, when we do it, are like, wow, I've never enjoyed a Snickers more in my entire life. So just practicing mindful eating with them can head off that uh, tendency to turn this into an overeating or unhealthy coping skill. Okay, that is all that I've got for you today. All the information I shared with you is taken from the DBT Skills Manual for Adolescents by Jill Rathis and Alec Miller. Thank you so much for listening, for continuing to listen, and for taking the time to learn coping skills. Well, we'll see you next time when we walk the middle path and be drama-free through DBT.